so we're, we've been talking about this issue of sort of uh, working from the outside in, you know, working first on root causes and then getting to violence, or working from the inside out, focusing first on, the, on violence uh, and hoping to impact root causes in that way. Let's assume that you're in the hot spot, you're working with the right, uh, the right group of people. Um, what's the appropriate blend of strat strategies there? I, and I would just point out that, you know, in Latin America, in many communities uh, in Latin America, the, the impunity levels are astounding. 90 to 95 percent of homicides in, in some countries go completely unpunished or unprosecuted. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a history uh, of extremely aggressive, tough on crime measures, mano dura strategies, as also not having been uh, uh, successful. So, you know, there's this seesaw effect of policy. If you're in the right place working with the right people, what's the appropriate balance between those approaches? Uh, who, Marcella, do you want to begin and then we'll sure. work down I mean the line? Sure. I mean, I can start with what I, what I saw on the ground, which is in, and in these particular places, where the places I was visiting where, it was where, where violence was pervasive, right? Like everything else had stopped because people were not safe. I mean, and, uh, and, and there it seemed that you were looking at alternative uh, efforts from the Mano Dura. The Mano Dura had obviously not worked to, um, you know, to really deal with the, with the gang issue. And it goes to some of the issues that, uh, that you both were mentioning, like at the end, the social issues of following the youth and the opportunities for the youth made a big difference, but that's a long chain, right? That happens from primary school and then it secondary school and then workforce development, but it's not just teaching them skills. You actually need to place them in places and follow them, each kid, to make sure that they keep that job. And if they don't keep it, and it's why, and they know that because, and, and you have to talk to the, to, to the actual firms that are hiring them, because when they see an FPV that they come from any of these three neighborhoods, they won't hire them because they know that they either are part of the gang or have you know, relationships with the gang. So it, it was a whole community approach at all levels for it to work. And the police is something that for me astounded me the most because I've been hearing, learning from you around community policing and it all sounds really good. You go to these places and you've been in Latin America, the idea of community policing seems like a very foreign concept. People fear seeing a policeman more than they fear, you know, seeing a thief. And, and yet, I saw it working, literally in these places where uh, the police had been trained, the head of, of the police said that when this crime had gone down tremendously, people were stopping him in the street to say, you know, everything really changed when you brought that new police force, that whole community policing thing, and these people are, you know, much more humane, much, you know, people are looking up after us. And he said, you know what, I didn't switch one person. It's the same police. They just went through this intensive training, and you heard them, of trying to understand the problem from the perspective of the youth and what they've been going through to create empathy for the people they were dealing with. So I do think that that uh, that these approaches that you know that that permeate every part of society in these hotspots um, is you know ha I've seen it have potential. So I'm hearing sort of a both and strategy. Yes. Okay, uh, Daniel. <clears throat> this is a great point that Marcela is raising, uh, which we haven't m touched upon before, which is the crisis of uh, legitimacy, legitimacy of the state in Latin America as a consequence of the failure of our states to provide basic services, among them, you know, public safety. Uh, so. The general distrust in the police is something that r is really, really, really makes policing a difficult job to do. If you want to do it right, you know, you don't, people don't trust you, which is what actually happens, uh, then it's just a much more uphill battle in general. So I think this is a very important point, um, and that's why I think police reform efforts are really important. But ultimately, if you think about the balance between prevention and control, this is a way of, of putting it. Um, <coughs> I think we need to do both. So this is uh, the short answer is to do both. And uh <coughs> but if you think about it, we've already decided to do both. Like we have, we're not, 
we've decided to have, as societies, we, we have like a department of urban upgrading, right? So we, we have a, a responsible person or group of people for having clean streets, having street lighting, having like nice parks. We have all of these things that are we have decided as societies that we want. We're just, in most cases, not able to deliver on that. Mm -hmm. So we have no street lighting. We have garbage in the streets. We have like, uh, so, so why don't we just think about delivering actually what we're of our, of our what we've already decided to deliver? So that's why I'm, that's why, in many cases, the question is not what to do, but how to do what you've already decided to do. Like provide basic policing services. We don't do that. Well, we don't. We actually don't do that because let me, let me just give you one example, uh, and and I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, we, I was doing a study with an important police department in Latin America, and we were seeing, look, so the study was based, like, was actually a hotspot study. So we designed, the, we identified the hotspots, and we told the, the police officers, okay, this is where you need to go at this time of the day, this many times. And so they said, oh, yes, 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 we'll do it, we'll do it. And then when we started monitoring their compliance, it was just, they weren't, del they were delivering about, 15% of the target amount of time they were supposed to deliver at the hotspots, okay? So because we were monitoring with GPS and all that. And so we started trying to dig in, trying to understand what was going on. Why were we not able to deliver this specific thing that we were, it turns out that, you know, after many months of trying to understand, we said, let's do a census of police and try to understand their motivations and see, you know, their leadership you know, what, how they view their job, their commitment to society, you know, all these stuff. So we said, let's do a census. And this is a police department that had about 800 uh, uh, sworn officers. It turns out that we found out by trying to do a census that about 40% <coughs> of the sworn officers would never show up to work over the course of two months. <laughs> and they were either... So, and they were not necessarily on medical leave. <laughs> so this is, this is just highlighting a very basic thing. You, we, I mean, we are not able to provide very basic things. Right. We don't really, I mean, of course, I, I, and, and I do, th I, I understand. I mean, I'm from Venezuela. I live in Caracas, and I have lived through the OLPs, which is the, or the, or the Organización for, Li for the Liberation of the People or something like that, which is basically death squads, of government death squads that go into poor neighborhoods and kill people. This is like the extreme version of Mano Dura, and it obviously doesn't work. You know, because look how many sides are up. You know, it's a, so it's, it's just the... Um, so governments sometimes try to, to innovate, trying to do like really new things and try to show when basic provision, like basic stuff, we can't do. We, we just can't deliver. So I think that it, it's, it would be useful to say we've already, as societies, like in our legal frameworks and our constitutions and everything, we already have a certain amount of balance between these two. Why don't we start delivering that, and then we can take the discussion a little bit further and see you know, where right. we want to prioritize. That's right. Natalie. Well, I think uh, we, we touched on, on a very important point. It's about the institutions in Latin America. Who are the police officers? Who are the people who are delivering the justice service? So, for example, only 40% of the citizens in Latin America trust the police, and 30 trust the justice system. And I think we are talking in, in, uh, something very important here about the role and the function and services that, being that, has, that have to be provided by the security service. The problem is that we work with governments, and governments are involved in politics. Governments have to show results. And, you know, when we talk about the loan prevention, social prevention intervention, they say it takes too long. No, it doesn't serve me. And this is why, for example, we work a lot with governments. The right balance is something that we, we, we find out to be very effective in engaging, engaging governments to work in a specific citizen security projects. 
And, and the balance is basically the combination of the control and deterrence interventions like hotspot policing. Uh, we have also uh, some interventions like uh, improvement of the public places. So we have some results that give some breeding for start social interventions. And, and in social interventions, we work, you know, targeting the, the, the most important factors that are linked to violence in one place. So I think this is something that's been working really good. We give uh, a, a good balance and we respond that gov to governments that they need to address the issue and sometimes they do it like a mano dura, putting more police on the street or putting more people in prisons and we know for evidence it doesn't work. So this